So we're continuing the buzzword, buzzword series, and uh, last week we talked about sacrifice and atonement. So if you were here last week, you probably regretted it. <laughs> you are thinking, I didn't really come to church to hear about bloody sacrifices, right? Um, but hopefully I was able to kind of clear some of that up for you, that um, sacrifice is not what we think of in uh, modern times. There was a whole different idea about it back then, and, uh, and it was a good thing. It was, a, it was the way that you brought a gift to your creator. You brought him something he had already given you, and it was a way to um, commune with your, your creator. Uh, so we talked about that last week, and we talked about atonement, um, but I mentioned forgiveness last week, but I didn't have time to really dig into that, and uh, was going to cover the, uh, the term holiness today, but the more I was studying, I was like, you know, this forgiveness thing, we really need to latch on to this because it's not just that God forgives us, but he also calls us to do some forgiving, doesn't he? All right? So that's what we're going to dig into today. Uh, we need to understand how the Bible defines this word, uh, and we need to understand how we're supposed to forgive and not forgive. That sounds a little weird, like aren't we always supposed to forgive? And the answer is yes, but if you have the wrong definition of what that means, um, you may misunderstand what it means to forgive someone else. So uh, we're going to dig into that pretty deep this morning. Now, if you have an old-fashioned vintage Bible with pages, um, you can turn to Exodus 34 and Matthew 18. Those are the two main passages we're going to be in. We're going to cover some other ones as well, but we'll kind of go through those quickly. So uh, Exodus 34, um, we'll talk about the character of God there. And then we're going to go to Matthew 18 to talk about how we're supposed to do this forgiveness thing. So if you want to just kind of hold those two places, uh, it'll be a while before we get to Matthew 18. Um, but if you're in our notes and our app, everything's already in there. You don't have to go find anything. It's, it's all mapped out there for you. Um, now, so let's start off with defining the term forgiveness. Now, I'm just go ahead and tell you, I'm pretty excited about this one, okay? Because I don't know if you've been forgiven, but it's a big deal, right? So if I get preachy, just, you just have to put up with it, all right? Because this is good news, what we're talking about here today. And I'm excited about it. I hope you're excited about it uh, because this really is a big deal. So let's talk about what the word means, and I'll define it in Hebrew and in Greek uh, because we're going to read from the Old Testament and the New Testament. So the Old Testament was written in what language? Hebrew. The New Testament is written in Greek. Okay, just kind of get that stuck in your head. You don't need to know Hebrew and Greek. I'm going to do it for you. Um, so here's, here's the Hebrew word is nasa, and we talked about that last week. Uh, you know, to us Southerners, it looks like NASA. Um, and that is kind of where they get their name from, NASA. It means to lift, lift off, right? Lift up. Um, so this word in Hebrew means to lift up or to carry away. It can mean to exalt, which has got that lift up idea to it. And it can also be used to talk about maintaining something, maintaining a relationship. Make sense? Okay, now in the New Testament, the, uh, the Greek word is aphemi, and what, uh, what that means is it can mean to leave behind, so there's something that you're deciding to leave behind. Make sense? See how the forgiveness idea kind of comes into this? Uh, it can mean to pardon or to send away, but the most, uh, kind of the most popular usage of this Greek word is to release something. So it's like you have something in your hands, and you just release it and drop it. Okay, and that's going to make sense when we get to the New Testament uh, here in a little while. So here's what I want you to get stuck in your head, and we'll come back to it, is this idea of something being lifted up, all right? Um, now, today we're going to talk about two directions of forgiveness, all right? The vertical and horizontal. So there's how God forgives us, that's the vertical, and horizontal is how we forgive one another. So that's the two categories, the two directions of forgiveness that we're going to talk about today. So that's why we're going to start in the Old Testament, talk about how God forgives and why he does that. And then the New Testament, we're going to get practical and talk about what do we do with this forgiveness we've been given. Are we called to give it away? Do you know the answer to that question already? <laughs> yes, we are called to forgive, right? All right, so here's what I want to do. Um, we're going to start actually in Genesis for a second because I always like to go back to the very beginning. 
Um, now, I did this search. Uh, I have this fancy Bible software called Logos Bible Software, and uh, it allows me to search for a Hebrew word. So I took the word uh, forgive, nasa in Hebrew, and I did a search, and it'll just show you everywhere in the Bible in the Hebrew text where that word shows up. And the first hit I got was in Genesis chapter 4, okay, which is interesting because in our English Bibles, the word forgive is not in that passage because they translated it to something else. So here, here we go. This is the Cain and Abel story, right? Cain and Abel offer a sacrifice, a gift to God, and um, something is wrong with Cain. Something's wrong with his motivation, his heart behind it, um, and his gift is, is not as good as his brother Abel's gift. And uh, you know the story, Cain gets really angry, and his face has fallen. In other words, he's kind of down and out, so think he's down. Okay, And the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? And the word anger there means hot. Why are you hot? And why has your face fallen? So he's, he's down. He says, if you do well, or literally, literally, if you do good, will you not be se'et in Hebrew? And that, the root word of that, that Hebrew word is nasa. So you could translate it, this way, if you do good, will you not be lifted up? See the forgiveness lifted up language there? So literally what God is saying to a man who is hot with anger, he wants to kill his brother. He's so jealous and so angry, he wants to kill his own brother. And God comes to him and has a conversation about his situation. You see the loving heart of God here? He's trying to prevent Cain from what he wants to do. And he comes to him and he says, look, why are you so angry and why are you down? If you do the right thing here, if you turn away from the direction that your heart and your mind is leading you to, this murder, if you turn away from that, that's what repent means, by the way, to turn away from. If you turn away from that, won't you be lifted up? So your face has fallen, and I want to lift you up. I want to forgive you, right? So in the very beginning, God is talking to a future murderer. He's going to murder his own brother, and God is trying and pleading with him, do the right thing, Cain. Turn away from how you feel right now, and if you do, you'll be lifted up. But if you don't, there's a crouching serpent at the door. And its desire is against you. And you have to rule over it. It wants to rule you. You must rule over it. So we see this nasa, this lifting up language from the very beginning of the Bible. And it looks like to me that God's desire from the very beginning of the book is to forgive. Isn't that good news? Right? It's not to punish. His desire is to forgive. And he's pleading with a, with a would-be murderer. And we know, what does Cain do? He doesn't listen to God. He's not, he doesn't really care about being accepted or lifted up by God. He, he wants to stay in his anger and jealousy. And he decides to kill his brother, and he does. And there are generational consequences to that decision. So we see from the very beginning this principle. Forgiveness follows repentance. If you repent, you have the opportunity to be forgiven. But please know this, where there is no repentance, there is no forgiveness. If we don't turn away from our sin, how could we be forgiven of it? Because if we don't turn away, it means we're continuing in it. We're not asking to be forgiven, right? Now, as you know, modern Christians, what we like to do, and I, I don't want to be negative here, but sometimes the truth is negative, uh, as modern Christians, we want God to forgive us and still continue in our sin, right? Come on, we've all been there, right? You might have been there yesterday or this morning, <laughs> right? You'll probably be there this afternoon, right? That What we like to do because we kind of want things our own way and we want it now kind of thing, uh, we're J.G. Wentworth Christians. <laughs> it's mine and I want it now, you know, that thing. Um, that's probably not even a commercial anymore. That's how, I don't have... I don't watch commercials because we don't have TV. But um, we, want, we want God to be good to us 
even if we're not being good to him. Now, the good news about God is he wants to still be good to us. But we can't expect, we can't think that we're entitled to forgiveness for sins we refuse to repent of. Does that make sense? So it, forgiveness follows repentance. There from the very beginning, he just told Cain, you got to turn away from this and I will lift you up. But he didn't turn away. He stayed in his anger and killed his brother. And all of his descendants were murderers. They all did what Cain did. It was the most violent place in the world where Cain's descendants lived. Now, if you fast forward to uh, Exodus, there's a passage here, and if, you, if you're like reading an old-fashioned Bible, the reason I wanted you to turn there is I want you to make a note where this passage is, circle it or whatever. This is one of the most important passages to teach you who your creator is because it comes from God's own mouth to Moses. He says, this is exactly who I am. In case you ever get it twisted, this is who I am. Now, do we have a tendency to twist in our own mind who God is? Yes, we do. We do. So here's the clarity. Exodus 34, the Lord passed before Moses and proclaimed, because Moses has asked, I want to see your glory. I want to see you in all your fullness. And, and God says, how about this? Um, I need you to not die for my glory, because um, if you experience that, your human body can't handle it. So how about this, Moses? I'm going to pass by you, and I'm going to tell you exactly who I am. And it says this, the Lord, the Lord. And when you see Lord in all caps, it's the word Yahweh. That's God's, that's God's covenant name. Yahweh. It means I am that I am, or it can also, most, uh, most Hebrew scholars believe Yahweh means I am who brings to be. It's the creator. I am the one who brings things into existence. That's what Yahweh is all about. So he says, Yahweh, Yahweh, a God merciful and gracious. You're not excited. I can't believe it. Think about what he just said here. The first two things he picks about his character, he starts with mercy and grace. Isn't that awesome? Because he could have said, Yahweh, Yahweh, a God who's going to get you if you don't stop your sinning. He didn't start there, does he? He starts with this, Yahweh, Yahweh, a God who is merciful to you, a sinner a God who is gracious to you because he knows you're messed up. So he starts right out the gate telling Moses, in case you ever get it twisted about who I am, remember this. And by the way, this is the most, one of the most quoted passages in the rest of the Old Testament. They always look back to this passage and they declare, this is who our God is. A God merciful and gracious. And then look at this, slow to anger. Isn't that good? Because, you know, I don't know about you, but I tend to start thinking about God, and it just happens to all of us, I think, is we, when we know we're sinners and we, we kind of start feeling really guilty about some sin we've got going on, we tend to think God's angry right off the bat. Well, God knows what I'm doing. He can see everything. He sees my heart. He must be angry because here's the deal. You would be angry with you, wouldn't you? Yeah, and the reason you know that is because people sin against you, and what's your first reaction? You're ticked off. And we tend to see God through the lens of our own character, and that's not what you want to be doing. So because we get angry first, we tend to think of God that way. And listen, what do you do when someone is angry with you? You avoid them, don't we? So if you always think that God's first reaction is to be quick to anger, you will avoid him most of the time. But is that what he just said to Moses? No, he starts off, Yahweh, Yahweh, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger. It actually, in Hebrew, it's a, uh, it's a metaphor here. It means long of nose. That was a Hebrew idiom that meant slow to anger. Because uh, when, you would get, when you get angry, your nose can turn red, right? And, and so when your nose turns red, it means all the, all the blood has gotten there quickly. But if you have a long nose, it would take longer for your whole nose 
to, I, it sounds funny, but that's literally what, what it's saying here, right? So it's like me, right? I mean, look at this, right? So he's saying he's slow to get hot. Always remember this. Your heavenly father's first reaction is not anger. What's first on the list? Mercy, grace, patience. And he's abounding in, in Hebrew, it's he's abounding in hesed. Faithful, loyal love. It's translated steadfast, which means the same thing. It's just always loving toward you. He's abounding, overflowing, meaning he never runs out of it. <laughs> you ever run out of love for somebody? Yeah, let's be honest. You might have loved somebody until they wronged you enough times, and then it's like, I don't think I have to love you anymore, <laughs> right? But God is not like us. We hurt him repeatedly. He keeps on loving. He's abounding in hesed, faithful, loyal love. And he's faithful. He's abounding in faithfulness, which means his faithfulness to you, his desire for you to bless you, and to love you and keep you in his family, that desire is abounding. It doesn't run out. This is good stuff, isn't it? And then it says, just in case you didn't get it the first time, he's keeping. The literal word here is protecting. Protecting steadfast love for thousands of generations, literally in Hebrew. Thousands of generations. Here's what that means, okay? When you see thousands or the word thousand in your Bible, it's never literal. It never means only this much. Thousand in the Hebrew mindset means forever. And when it's plural, it means forever, forever. Forever times forever. He is keeping, protecting this love toward us for thousands of generations. It's a good God. And then here's our word. Nasah. Forgiving iniquity, transgression, and sin. Now, you might read that and think, why did he use three different words for, for evil things or bad things? Because those are the three categories of sin in the Hebrew mindset. Iniquity is that stuff where you pre-planned, you premeditated your sin. You planned to sin. You ever done that? Oh, nobody wants to admit that one. Yes, you have, right? You ever been mad at somebody and you planned in your mind what you were going to say to them the next day at work? That's iniquity. <laughs> you planned it out, right? Uh, transgression is when you crossed a boundary in some relationship. You violated some boundary. It's just like trespassing, right? It means you crossed a boundary you weren't allowed to. That's what transgression is. It's a very relational term. And sin is just missing the mark. It literally means you shot the arrow and you weren't even good enough to hit the target. It fell down before it even got there. That's what sin is. So what does God forgive? All of it. Good? Yeah, good. Y'all got to get more Pentecostal than this this morning. Now, I got, I got goosebumps on me right now. You need some of that, all right? I'll give you some, okay? He, he doesn't just forgive mistakes. He forgives intentional, planned out wickedness. He's that good. And he loves us that much. But then he says this, but who will by no means clear the guilty? He's a just God. He doesn't let sin go on forever. He puts a stop to it at some point. And we tend to think negatively about that, but listen to me. Look at me close. Now, listen. You want God to put an end to sin. You just don't want him to end yours. <laughs> Isn't that how we normally are? Right? I, why doesn't God do something about all the evil in this world? I see people on YouTube, they're making this argument all day long, every day. If God is a good God, he would end evil. And he doesn't, so therefore I don't believe in God. And here's my question every single time if I would ever get a chance to talk to these people. is I would say, here's your problem. You want God to end everybody else's evil, but leave yours alone. Because here's the deal. If you want God to solve the problem of evil right now, we're all dead. That's the only way to stop it. Because I, I don't know if you've noticed this, um, the trees in your yard don't do any evil. 
the animals don't do any evil. It's just us. We're the ones messing the place up. So if God's going to solve that problem, he can either find a way to forgive us and change us from evil to good, which is what he did through Jesus, or he could just kill us off. That's your two solutions. So he says, I'm not going to clear the guilty. I'm not just going to let unrepentant sin continue forever. I will put a stop to it. And he says he'll visit every generation to put an end to evil. This is not a generational curse, by the way. A lot of people misread this. He says he's visiting their iniquity. Well, how did he just describe how he visits iniquity? Well, he starts off with mercy and grace and patience and love and forgiveness, right? So this is God's character. And the, if you listed these out, there's seven characteristics here. And here's something you may not know about Hebrew uh, writers. Um, they do this thing called a chiasm, where if there's a list of something, you should write it out and figure what's in the middle of that list. Now, when, uh, there's seven of them in this list, and if you, you space them out, the middle characteristic in the list is love. And here's what Hebrew authors do that for. They want you to see that that's the characteristic that drives all the others in the list. So, the basis for God's character is his faithful, endless love, right? His love drives his desire to be merciful and gracious and to forgive your planned out sin, your oops, I crossed the line sin, and your I shot at it, but I didn't even get close sin. <laughs> his love drives his forgiveness for you. That's very important. Also, forgiveness is God's decision not to retaliate against us but to reconcile us and lift us up. Think about what I just said. Forgiveness is God's decision not to retaliate, but to reconcile and lift up, nasa, to forgive, right? Now, <clears throat> David, in the Psalms, uh, he, he wrote a lot of the Psalms. In Psalm 32, he tells us what our response, how we should feel, how we should think, about God's forgiveness, okay? And it's a, it's a praise psalm. Here we go. He says, blessed is the one. Now, you want to be blessed? Yeah? You want to be blessed? I don't mean material blessings right now. You want to be blessed by knowing you're forgiven? Yeah? So David knows that. Hey, did David uh, do some iniquity and some transgression and some sin? Uh, yeah, he actually did all three of those in one act. That whole Bathsheba thing, y'all know that story, right? Uh, and by the way, you might not realize this, that wasn't the only time David really messed up. David had 14 wives. He was never supposed to have more than one. <laughs> he was a ladies' man, not, a, not in a good way. <laughs> so he, he would know something about being forgiven for some awful things, wouldn't he? And he says, blessed. This means, the word blessed means joyful or happy, but happy is kind of a bad equivalent. A joyful mindset. So a joyful mindset has the one whose transgression is nasa, forgiven, whose sin is covered. That word in Hebrew is related to the word for atonement, kippur that we learned about last week. It means to be wiped clean or to be covered. So blessed is one whose transgression is forgiven, lifted up or carried away, and whose sin is covered or cleansed. Blessed is the man against whom, look, look at this, the Lord counts no iniquity. What does he mean right there? He says when you're forgiven... God is not counting that anymore. Paul picks up on this in the New Testament, 1 Corinthians 15, or might be 2 Corinthians. I get my addresses wrong sometimes. Um, Paul says that God, through Christ, is no longer counting our sins against us. That's good news. That's good news, right? So he says, blessed is the one to whom the Lord counts no iniquity. Now, I want you to hang on to that idea of counting because it's going to come up in the New Testament in a minute, all right? So 
God, if he's forgiving us, then he's not counting those things that are forgiven against us. It's, it's like the record has been wiped clean. Good news. Okay? And then he says, in whom, uh, whose spirit there is no deceit. That's repentance language. The reason why you're in that situation of being forgiven and covered and blessed and not counted and all that is because you've decided to repent from the innermost being, your spirit. Okay? Now, all right, so let's review before we go to the New Testament here. Forgiveness means to be lifted up, right? Literally, it means nasa, to lift up. Now, Here's what's interesting about that. I was studying this and I thought, you know, there's a lot of lift up language in the New Testament. Did you know that Jesus describes the cross as being lifted up? Isn't that interesting? So the Hebrew word, and and Jesus was a Jew, by the way. He wasn't a white American. I know all the paintings seem to look that way, but that's not what he looked like. He looked more like Osama bin Laden than he looks like us. I know that makes you uncomfortable. I I like doing that to you. Um, He was a Jew, which means he functions with a Hebrew mindset, the culture he was raised up in. And, you know, he kind of wrote the Old Testament. (laughs) You know, he was the one guiding them to write it. Now, so if he thinks lift up, is the definition of forgiveness, because it was. And then he describes the cross as being lifted up. How do you think the Israelites uh, thought of the cross? They had to have connected it to, this act is a forgiving act. Right? So I'll just read some passages for you. He says this, he's talking to Nicodemus, who's like the lead teacher of Israel who cannot figure out what Jesus is talking about. He says, as Moses lifted up, the serpent in the wilderness. By the way, this was a story about when uh, a serpent was put on a cross. We tend to not make that connection. Uh, You can't put a serpent on a pole unless you have a cross beam and wrap it around so it hangs there. So look at the defeated serpent and you'll be healed. That was that story. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up. So he's describing his sacrifice on the cross as a lifting up. He says, so that whoever believes in him, the one who's been lifted up, will have eternal life. Interesting. Then he goes on in John 8. So Jesus said to them, when you have lifted up the Son of Man, you will know that I am. Now your English Bible probably says something like, I am he. And they're trying to make it make more sense, but they're totally covering up what Jesus is doing. He's saying, I am. That's the word Yahweh. (laughs) When you have lifted me up, you will know that I am. And he goes on to say this. Amen, that's right. Somebody's amen to me over here. Doing better than the rest of (laughs) y'all. In John chapter 12, and if you read John's gospel, John chapter 12 is like the hinge in the gospel. All the way leading up to chapter 12, it's my time has not yet come, over and over and over and over again. And in John uh, chapter 12, Jesus finally says, the hour has come. It's time to do this thing. And he says this, and I love this passage. He says, now is the judgment of this world. Now will the ruler of this world, who do you think that is? Satan, the serpent. Now will the ruler of this world be cast out And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all people to myself. So Jesus saw the cross as a forgiveness event. He was offering himself as a sacrifice. And going off of what we learned last week, that meant he was offering himself, his perfect self, as a gift to God on our behalf. He lifted himself up on a cross, and guess what else he was doing? He was lifting us up with him. Because Paul's going to say in Romans, you have been crucified with Christ. You died the death he died. So when he represented us as an offering to God, we were there with him if we've placed our faith in him. If we've looked to the one who was lifted up in faith, we get lifted up too. Man, isn't that good? 
This is way better to me than it is to you right now, but if you'll think about this this week, I, I think it'll do something for you. If, you. if he's lifted up and forgiveness means to be lifted up, we've been lifted up with him. We were forgiven because of what he did for us. Now, that's all, that's all good news, right? We, we kind of get that one. Okay, God wants to forgive us because he loves us, right? And he's not... He's slow to anger. He's not out for, to get us or to punish us. He actually wants to forgive us, right? We all understand that one. But here's the problem. There's that second part where we have to do what he did. We have to forgive like he forgives. You know, Jesus says this thing. We're actually going to pray it later at the end. Um, in the Lord's Prayer, it's a beautiful prayer except for this one line. You ever been praying the Lord's Prayer and seriously thinking about the words? Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Yeah, that's great. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Man, that's awesome. Give us this day our daily bread. Man, that's awesome. Forgive us, yeah, like we forgive others. Hmm. See, that's where forgiveness becomes an issue. Because he asked us, the guy, the man who lifted himself up so we could be lifted up, looks back at us and goes, now do what I did. And when you pray, I want you to ask God to forgive you the same way that you forgive other people. I don't know about you, but when I get to that line, I usually stop. And I go, huh, I better think about this here. Have I not forgiven somebody? Is there somebody I'm holding something against? Is there somebody that I've said I forgive them, but really I still want them to pay for it? Because if that's true, and then I ask God to forgive me like that, that's bad. I don't want him to forgive me like I forgive. I do want to learn to forgive the way he does. That's the purpose of that prayer, is to teach us. You better slow down and think about how you're treating people because that's how God's going to treat you. Hmm. So let's talk about this horizontal part. We all love the first one, right? God forgives us, yay, awesome, right? It's that second one we got issues with. And hey, we're not alone. We're about to read where Peter is struggling with this forgiveness thing. Now, Peter had a lot of struggles. He was human like the rest of us. So here we go. You ready? We're going to get practical now. Then Peter came up to him, that's Jesus, and said, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Like, how many times I got to do this? As many as seven times? Now, just hang on, don't read on yet. Don't look at the screen, look at me. Peter thinks he's being overly generous. How many times do I have to forgive my brother when he hurts me? Um... Like as many as seven times, Jesus? I think I could do seven. Seven in the Jewish mind means finished, completed, right? So he thinks after, you know, when I do seven of them, now, now notice Peter is counting. Remember I told you to hold on to that whole he's not counting things against us? Yeah? Okay, so Peter is, is counting. All right, Jesus, how many times do I have to do this now? Like as many as seven times, which means now it's done, and number eight, I don't have to do this anymore? Like the eighth time he hurts me, I can just say, heck with you, right? And he thinks he's being generous, and Jesus just kicks him right in the throat. <laughs> not literally, but Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times. Oh, come on, Peter, seven times, gosh, no, no. I say 77 times. And in the Greek, it's, it's hard to tell. There's a big debate about this between Greek scholars, but um, it can mean 77 times, or it could also be translated 70 times 7, which would be 490 times. Now, is Jesus' point here math? No. His point is, Peter, stop counting. Stop counting people's sins against you. Stop keeping records, Peter. That's the point. Because look, if you had to count to 490, 
you would lose count somewhere along the way. That's the point. Lose count. Why? Because we're supposed to forgive like God forgives us, right? And God doesn't count. He's not counting our sins against us. Peter is saying, all right, Jesus, I'm keeping count over here, so how far do I have to go? And Jesus says, you're missing it. You're missing it. Now, I want to say something before we go any further, because Jesus is about to tell a parable. It's one of my favorites, and we're going to have to think really hard to get what's going on here. But um, before we go on any further, please understand, I know there are a multitude of questions that come up in your mind when we're talking about forgiving people. Because here's the deal. Some people love to hurt you. There are people like that. Um, And what are we supposed to do with that? Because we have the same question Peter has, don't we? How many times do I have to forgive this idiot? <laughs> right? And look, he, God, he, he gets it. God is a God who has dealt for all of human history repeated sins. Yes? So he would understand, okay? Now, the thing that we tend to do is we start in this passage, but we hadn't read what happens before this passage. So here's some issues that will come up in our mind, like, okay, but what if that person is not repentant and they keep hurting me the same way over and over again, or in different ways, but they refuse to acknowledge it, they refuse to apologize, they refuse to repent, they just keep right on doing it. Does that mean I'm supposed to just lay down and be a Christian doormat for this person for the rest of my life? That's a... That's a good question, okay? Now, if you start in this passage and you don't read the one right before it, which is why Peter asked the question, you will start to think wrongly that we're supposed to be doormats. We're just supposed to let someone keep hurting us and stay in relationship with them and be hurt by them forever. However, the conversation right before this one, I'll just I'm, it's not on the screen, but I'm going to read it for you. He says this, so the question is, if somebody keeps doing that, am I supposed to just ignore it and just continue to forgive and act like it didn't happen? No. Verse 15 of Matthew 18, this is why I had you turn there so you could look at it. He says, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. So what is he saying here? He's not saying ignore it. He's not saying, well, just forgive in your heart and act like it didn't happen. What do you do when someone hurts you? You go tell them they hurt you. Because here's the other thing. They might not know they hurt you. And you're all upset and can't sleep, and they're sleeping just fine. They might not know. But what if you go to them and you say, you hurt me, and they say, whatever, get over it. Well, if he listens to you, you've gained your brother. But if he does not listen, then take one or two others along with you so that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. So this doesn't sound like we're supposed to just ignore stuff. We're supposed to deal with stuff, right? So we are supposed to deal with someone who's hurt us. We don't ignore it, and we don't just lay down and be a doormat. We follow Jesus' instructions, and we go to them. And if they say, well, I don't care, you shouldn't have got your feelings hurt. You ever heard that one? You shouldn't have got your feelings hurt, as if I hurt my own feelings, Right? It's a dumb response, right? You shouldn't have got your feelings hurt. How about, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to hurt your feelings. That'd be a better response. I'm getting preachy now. Um, so if they, they don't care, then you go take a couple more people in, in your church community. Amen. Right. You take a couple people in your church community, and you go to them, and you say, now, are you going to still continue in this sin and act like it doesn't matter, or are you going to listen to all of us now? And if they say, I don't care what y'all say, I'm not repenting of this. I'm going to continue doing what I want to do. Look what he says next. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. Have you ever seen this happen? No, it's because we're scared. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you a Gentile and a tax collector. Now, how did Jews think about Gentiles and tax collectors? They didn't have any relationship with him. So what is Jesus teaching in that passage? He's not teaching to be a doormat, and he is not, listen to me close now, 
He is not teaching people to stay in an abusive relationship. He's saying if they refuse to stop that, you end the relationship. Now, I know this gets really complex, and there's 10 million questions that go along with it, okay? And look, different situations would require different types of responses. But if you're a person, especially ladies, if you are in any kind of relationship where you are being abused, Jesus is not teaching you to stay in the abuse. He's teaching you to deal with it the way he's outlined. There will be witnesses involved. Your church gets involved. And if they say, I don't care what any of y'all say, I'm not doing this. And Jesus says, you treat that person like your enemy. They are your enemy. Now, he also says you have to love your enemies. But that does not mean you have to stay there and get your face pounded in. No scripture says that. And I have listened. I'm going to get angry here for a minute. I'm short of nose for a minute, okay? I have listened to pastors, prominent pastors, who are teaching women that because there's no verse that says if he hits you, leave, then they have to stay there and be abused for the sake of Christ. John MacArthur teaches that. One of the most prominent pastors in this country. His seminary that he has. I listened to a video of their seminary professors teaching that. You have to stay in the abuse and be a missionary to your husband. Okay, I'm going to use a Greek word. Bullcrap. <clears throat> that guy's not a believer if he's putting his hands on you. If you're dealing with a, a situation where somebody's, if you're married and they're repeatedly cheating on you, repeatedly, and they refuse to repent, you are not required to stay in that abuse. You are required to deal with it. You are required to get people to come help you deal with it. But if they refuse, you end that relationship. But does that mean you can't forgive them? You can still forgive. But see, in our American minds, we've, we have equated forgiveness with reconciliation, and that's not always the case. You can forgive, but end the relationship. Okay? That's what he just described, and that led Peter to go, um, I got questions. <laughs> what if the guy keeps on doing, like, are you saying, for, if I got to forgive him, how many times I got to do that? And then he's going to tell a parable to help Peter out. And this is going to help us because it's going to, it's going to show us both directions of forgiveness, the vertical and the horizontal, all in the same story. Okay? This is one of my favorite parables. Here we go. You ready? You ready? I know that we kind of, kind of got weird there for a minute. I got preachy, but that, this is good stuff. This is, this is going to help us. He says, therefore, the kingdom of God, or kingdom of heaven, may be compared to a king. Now, who do you think the king in this story is going to be? It's going to be God, right? Okay, so it may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. That's kind of like judgment day, <laughs> okay? But just think in, in a literal world right now. A king wants to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. Now, that doesn't mean he, had ten, he could play 10,000 instruments, okay? Talent is a bag of money. Now, let me just help you understand how much money this servant owes the king, all right? 10,000 talents. A talent, one talent, is 20 years' worth of wages. This guy owes the king 200,000 years of wages. Now, Jesus has picked this very extreme example on purpose. He wants to shock you into thinking about this story, okay? So, um, so let's translate it into modern terms, okay? He began to settle, and one was brought to him who owed him a gazillion dollars. That's how we should think of it, okay? And, uh, and since he could not pay, <laughs> obviously, his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and children and all that he had and payment to be made. Now, we read that, we're like, whoa, what? Jesus is speaking into the culture he's in at that time. 
because there was no such thing as bankruptcy. There was no protection. If you, were, if you could not pay your debts, you had to be a servant of somebody else until your debt could be paid off. And if you owe a gazillion dollars, you're going to serve until the day you die. Your kids are going to serve your wife until that debt is paid off. Your entire lineage is in debt to your debtor. That's how it worked. Aren't you glad it's different today? Okay. Um, but by the way, if they were doing the Jewish law like they were supposed to back then, this would have never happened because there was the Jubilee year. There was the Sabbath year where everybody's debts were forgiven and all your land was restored to you. And if you were a slave, you were set free. But they weren't doing it right back then. So you would not have been in generational slavery or poverty because all your debts would have been forgiven. Every 49 years, every generation got a new start. That was God's plan. That's good, right? You read the Torah, you, the Torah and you think, this is weird. No, it's good. It was a good system. They just wouldn't do it. So that's what he's saying is, okay, you can't pay this, then you're going to have the natural consequences. But the servant fell on his face, on his knees, imploring him, have patience with me and I will pay you everything. 200,000 years worth of wages? So when we hear this, when you read this story, here's what you're supposed to think. That's not possible. The servant who's in debt is making a promise he cannot fulfill. It's kind of like when we tell God, uh, forgive me, I'll never do that again. And I think God laughs. Because we're like the servant. Oh, I can pay back 200,000 years of wages. No, you can't. And the king knows he can't pay. So what does he do? And for compassion for him, pity is not the right word. He was moved with compassion for him. The master of that servant, look what he says. <clears throat> the master of that servant released him and forgave him the debt. Wait, wait a minute. Then who paid? Now, here's, here's, I'm, I'm going to harp on this for a minute because it's very important we get this. I talked about this a little bit in the atonement stuff uh, a couple weeks ago or last week. We have this mindset because modern theologians have taught us this, that somebody has to pay for our sin. God can't forgive if somebody doesn't pay. We've been taught that. And it makes sense to us because we kind of understand that, well, if our sin is like a debt, then somebody's got to pay it, right? And we've been taught that because of God's anger for sin, he had to kill something. So good news, he killed his own kid, right? And that kind of like, oh, I don't know, if that, is that right? We've been taught that God has to be paid off. Here's the problem with that. Jesus just told a story where the debt was just canceled. Nobody pays the debt in this story. Here's what that means. Your heavenly father can just simply forgive you. Nobody has to pay. Why? Well, because he's God. <laughs> like who imposed these rules on God that he has to work the way we work? Right? Because here's the deal. When you think about forgiveness, here's how we tend to think about this. When somebody wrongs us, somebody's got to pay. Right? Right? And if I'm just going to forgive somebody, I mean, think about this. Uh, my truck is sitting outside, and I got the truck a few months ago, and, and I like my truck, okay? I hate the gas mileage, but I like the truck, all right? Um, if you, after church, decided because you were jealous of my truck, which would be your own sin problem, but... If you did, and then you decided you're just going to run into it, and you messed up part of the truck, and I walked out and I was like, what? Oh, no, what happened? Because <laughs> I would be so calm and long of nose about it. Um, and then you said this, I'm so sorry, I, I just lost it for a minute, and I'm so sorry, I, I'm, I'm so sorry. 
what we want to do next in that situation is give me your insurance card. Somebody's got to pay for this. Forgiveness in this story would say, it's okay. I lose my temper too sometimes, and I've got enough money to cover that. It's okay. I actually heard an example of this recently. I just thought of it just now. Um, someone was having some work done on their, their kitchen and getting cabinets and countertops and stuff like that, and the person messed up and cut the countertop wrong, which cost a lot of money. And I asked the person, well, are you going to make them pay for that? And this person looked at me, and I was so impressed. They said, you know, the, the couple that was doing this countertop for us, they're, they're young, and they're new at this, and they, they cannot afford it. Would, it would end their business. So we're not going to make them pay for it. We're just going to forgive that. We all make mistakes. And I thought, that's how God forgives. See, we tend to think somebody's got to pay. Well, that's all fine and good, except that doesn't work out so well. And that's not how God does this. Your heavenly Father, according to the Son, says he just released it and forgave him. He let him go. He gave him freedom. And he cleared the debt. And it is 100% in the rights of the king to do so. Because who's going to tell the king he can't do that? But that's exactly what we do to God, don't we? I've seen this happen over and over again. It's happened to me. God forgives you. The people you hurt forgive you. And then there'll be a whole group of people that are mad. <laughs> well, I don't think it's fair that he got forgiven. I think he ought to have to pay for that. Well, that's fine until it's you. Because here's what my God does. He just releases and forgives. No payment needed. Your repentance is payment enough. Here's the deal, church. We're going to fail. And when we fail, we must repent. And when one of our family members fails and repents, we jump to forgive. We do not make repentant sinners pay. I've, listen to me close about this. I will kick you out of this church. We will vote you out of this church. If somebody fails and they repent, and you say, I'm not forgiving them until they have to pay for that, well, you can find somewhere else to go to church because we're going to be a family that when people repent, we forgive them because that's exactly what God does for us. Amen? That's what he's teaching right here. Jesus is teaching us about the Father. He can just flat out say, nah, you're forgiven. Wait, doesn't somebody have to pay for this? No, I'm the king. I make the rules. Let me just tell you something about your heavenly father. He doesn't play by your rules. So, well, that's not fair. Look, fair ended in Genesis chapter 3. Amen? <laughs> what do you mean fair? You, don't want, you do not want fairness, right? You want grace, don't you? And grace, by definition, is not fair, right? And it feels unfair when somebody's forgiven and they don't have to pay. That's a problem with us, not with God. So he just released him. Now, now listen, if the story ended right there, it'd be like happily ever after. It's like a Disney movie. Everything was just perfect at the end, right? Problem is, is the very next word is but. But when that servant went out, now he should have went out rejoicing. Man, I'm going to be the most forgiving person ever because of what's just been done to me. But that, that same servant went out, and he found one of his fellow servants, someone on the same social level as him, who owed him 100 denarii. That's 100 days' wages. Okay? You might as well just think 100 bucks. Okay, he just got forgiven a gazillion dollars, right? He goes out and finds one who owes him a hundred bucks. And what does he do? Does he first start with a conversation? No, because this dude is very short of nose. 
he seized him and he began to choke him, saying, pay what you owe me. This guy was just forgiven a gazillion dollars. He was saved from slavery. Get it? Remember we talked about salvation, and that word means to be saved from slavery, right? He was saved from slavery. His debts were canceled. The first thing he does is go find some puny guy just like him who owed him a hundred bucks. And the first thing he does is not, hey, brother, how are you? He puts his hands around his neck, starts choking the life out of the guy, and says, pay what you owe me. Now, here's what, here's what I know about all of us in here. We read this story and we think, that sorry joker. But you're supposed to read this like you're looking in the mirror. Because this is us. God's forgiven you of a gazillion sins. And the first time somebody sins against you, you want to choke them. And I do too. I'll just be honest with you. If you hit my truck after church, I will want to choke you. I won't. I don't think. But I will, I, I will want to. <laughs> okay, I will have to. I'll be like Cain in that moment. My face will be falling. And I will have to seriously consider my actions from that point forward, right? This is us. He'd just been forgiven of a gazillion dollars. He's choking a guy to death for a hundred bucks. His fellow servants, <laughs> sorry. <clears throat> so his fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him. And he says the same exact thing this guy said to the king. Have patience with me. I will pay you. And this guy actually could pay him back. This was a smaller amount. It could be done. Have patience with me, I will pay you. But he refused. And he went and put him in prison until he should pay the debt. Now think about how stupid this is. I need you to work and pay off your debt, so I'm going to throw you in jail. Did you get it? Kind of hard to work and pay your debts off if you're in jail. Because jail's not like jail today, okay? You can actually work and make money while you're in jail and you can sell ramen noodles and swap stuff out and all that. That's not how it was back then, okay? You could trick the guard into bringing you something and you know all that kind of stuff. That's not how it worked back then. Do you see how, you see how dumb unforgiveness can be? I want you to pay so bad that I'm going to throw you in jail where you can't pay me. <laughs> you see how messed up that is? It's an oxymoron situation, right? <laughs> You're not going to get paid back if you throw the guy in prison. I don't care. I'm mad. That's how this went. How's this going to work out for this guy? Well, his fellow servants saw what had taken place. There was a few guys standing around on the same social level. They're all servants. And they saw how this went down. So what do they do? They go tattle on him. They were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their master all that had taken place. They went to the king who just forgave him a gazillion dollars. And then they watched. You're choking a guy over a hundred bucks? Now you're going to throw him in prison? Which, by the way, usually meant you're going to be tortured? So they go tell the king. And his master summoned him and said, You wicked servant. I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. You pleaded with me and said you were repenting of this. Right? And I just forgave you. And should... Should not you have met, had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? Shouldn't you have done for that servant what I did for you? It's a brilliant story, isn't it? And in anger, his master delivered him to the jailers until he could pay all of his debt. Now, he owed a gazillion dollars, remember? He's never getting out. He's never getting out. Now, I told you at the beginning, the king, the master, is God. The servants are us. So if we choose to act like that wicked servant and choke people because they sinned against us, even though God's forgiven us of a gazillion sins, we're going to be jailed if we act like that. 
we're going to be imprisoned. Let me tell you something about unforgiveness. It's prison. It will eat you from the inside out. And if you choose for the rest of your life that you're not going to forgive people because you're angry and you have a right to be angry and you're going to be mad and unforgiving forever, just know you have an eternal jail to go to. And if I were you, I'll take being released and forgiven. But it doesn't mean, remember, it doesn't mean you're just going to be a doormat. It doesn't mean you have to stay in a certain relationship where none of this is ever changing. Nobody's repenting. That doesn't mean any of that. It just means you choose not to make them pay for it. Remember I told you forgiveness on God's end is a decision not to retaliate, but to reconcile or to lift us up? Here's what it means for us, right? I meant to bring one up on stage with me, but I forgot it in my office. We like to pick up rocks, don't we? Somebody sins. Like, it'd be convenient if we were kind of like David and we had some rocks we could sling, <laughs> right? We like to pick up our rocks and throw them at people who hurt us. Forgiveness is not saying that what they did is okay. Forgiveness is not saying I have to stay best friends with this person. That's not forgiveness. Forgiveness is taking your rock and dropping it. It's saying... What you did to me was wrong, and whether you repent or not, I'm not retaliating. That's forgiveness. That's what it means. He ends with a statement that ought to scare us. And we don't like to think of this. We don't like to think of fear and being scared and all that. But you just need to let this scare you, okay? So also my Heavenly Father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. If you don't put your rocks down, you're going to be like that servant, that wicked servant in the story. You're going to be imprisoned both spiritually and possibly eternally. Because you know, at the end of the Lord's Prayer, when he says, or in the middle, he says, forgive us as we forgive those who sinned against us. And then at, after the prayer is over, Jesus explains that when he says, for if you do not forgive people's sins against you, Neither will my heavenly Father forgive you of your sins against him. So that's your choices. So here's the deal. Like I said, forgiveness is not, it's not just making everything okay and being a doormat. Today, we choose to drop our rocks. That's forgiveness. I'm not going to hold this against them. I'm not going to keep count. Is it seven times or is it 77 or is it 490? Jesus would say, quit counting. Love keeps no record of wrongs, 1 Corinthians 13. Today, we drop our rocks for good. Amen? We forgive because we've been forgiven. And because it's so good to be forgiven. And listen, I can tell you from experience. I made some bad decisions. And I was forgiven. And I have not been made to pay for it. Because some people in my life understood what we just learned. And they set their rocks to the side. And said, did you repent? Yes, yes, I'm never going back. I, I, there's no way. I destroyed myself. I repent. I never want to be part of that kind of mess again. Then you're forgiven. So I don't know how all this hits you today. But I do know this. This is a tough one. And I acknowledge that. And God knows that. The decision today for us is if you've got some sin you're hanging on to in the vertical realm, you've got some things you're hanging on to and you don't want to repent of them, I want to, I want to encourage you to let it go. To turn away from the direction you're going. 
Don't do what Cain did and stay with your sin and become a murderer. Repent of your sin and be reconciled to a forgiving, loving, gracious, merciful God who can't wait to forgive you. Or maybe you're here and some people have hurt you. And listen, we're a family here. We got people in here who are hurting. Hopefully not because we did something to them, but because somebody who's not in this room today did something to them. And we've got more than one. And I just want you to understand this. What they did to you is not okay. You're not required to put yourself back in a situation where they continue to hurt and abuse you. But you are required to drop your rocks. To decide, I'm not going to make them pay for what they've done to me. Because my Heavenly Father's not making me pay. And when you do that, you get out of jail. You get out of that prison of the hurt and the anger and the resentment and the bitterness. And I'm telling you today, listen to me. Freedom is so much better than the prison. And it's yours. You can have that freedom. You just have to decide. And it's not easy and we're all praying for you. And we all want to help you. It's a process, I know. But I can tell you this. Forgiveness is worth it. It's worth the effort because it changes people's lives. It changes you. When you can let it go, you will be changed. And you can move on to what God has for you next. I'm not a prophet but there are moments where I feel like the Spirit would have me say something directly to us. And I kind of think this might be one of those moments. Um, so I, I just want to be clear and say, I don't, I don't know how you need to hear this, but just listen. Your Heavenly Father knows how bad you hurt. And he cares about that a lot. And he's not running away from you because things in your life aren't just right. He's not standoffish and appalled by some sin that you may have committed. He actually came right here today to meet you. To let you know that you are forgiven. And that you can forgive. And if you will, he will bless you. So I just want you to take that and believe it today. When I was forgiven, it changed me. And it changed all of us for the better. And listen, we wouldn't even be sitting here right now. In this location this church wouldn't exist right now if it were not for forgiveness. You have all that at your disposal that you can have. So for the next few minutes, we're going to listen to a song that you probably haven't heard before. It's one of the best songs in the world. And we can sing along if we learn it. It's pretty easy, but um, it's all about the mercy of Jesus. And I would invite you to take these next few moments to pray, to think about if there's somebody you haven't forgiven, and to put your rock down. If there's some sin you're holding on to between you and God, turn away from it. Decide today to get out of jail and repent. Because he will forgive you. And by his spirit, he can give you the ability to forgive someone else. So let's just kind of let that sit with us as we listen to these words and think about how merciful he is to us. And if you feel led, come take communion and continue to worship. I believe God, listen, I really think God is doing something right now. 
and I think it might change some people's lives. Let's stand and we'll pray together.